What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to a reaction to another FNAF game theory. This came out yesterday, and it is the first game theory, or it's the first FNAF game theory, where MatPat is not the host. This is going to feel a little bit strange, but I, be I believe in Tom. I believe in Tom. Uh, <laughs> he's doing a good job so far with the Game Theory channel, I think. I think all of the hosts are. I think I'm starting to get used to it. So this one is called FNAF The Circus of Horrors. I have a feeling this is going to be about Full Fest and the fact that in Help Wanted 2 you have, of course, the Full Fest 1970 poster. So before we get into this, probably I, I would say my theory is that we will be getting a FNAF Origins game that Steel will wanted to do. And it will be about an incident that happened at Full Fest. Maybe it's related to Andrew from the Fazbear Frights. Maybe it's William Afton's first ever victim, probably even before the Missing Children incident and Charlotte Emily. Yeah, I think we should probably just get straight into this and see what the crack is. But um, it's definitely going to be about Full Fest because it just keeps reappearing and there seems to be this travelling circus that happened way before Fred Bears as we got on the screen right now. Let's just get into it. Fred Bear's family diner. This is where it all began. The animatronic yeah. empire, the string of deaths, and William's descent into madness. Everything stemmed from this one location. Or at least sure. that's what we all thought until today. Okay. He's bringing up Hello, the mascot Internet. suits at the Welcome Mimic House Welcome to Game well. Theory, where it is finally time. Today, I graduate from FNAF Boy to FNAF Man and take on my very first Yay. FNAF Theory. Although, I say that, I have actually been helping Matt write FNAF Theories for the past yeah. three years. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, have Matt. Have a safe flight back. Bye. I didn't get to talk to you about Gregory as a robot. It's all right. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that was both of our sin. But, you know. <laughs> I threw something out. My first FNAF Theory. I threw something out. Yeah. <laughs> Gregory is a robot. First FNAF oh. Theory. And look how well-received it's been. The Look how good that's gone for all of it's, us. It's done so well for all of us. Yeah. I, I, I sort of feel sorry for him, man. Uh, uh, although, I guess he didn't take a lot of the punches. I think Matt Pat took most of the punches there. But, um, yeah, that, that was kind of... Um, that was kind of a period in time on the Game Theory channel where I think they got a lot of criticism and I, I do feel a, quite sorry for them because they are just putting out ideas, they're putting out interesting ideas as well, which is the thing. I was actually, I had the potential to go and watch the FNAF movie with Tom. Unfortunately, it, it kind of fell through because it was kind of, I was trying to plan it so late. Um, we were trying to plan it in October, but I wasn't able to in the end. But um, maybe next time, maybe for the FNAF movie too, Tom, if you're watching. <laughs> eh, what could possibly go wrong? But don't worry, theorists. I promise today's theory is way less crazy, hopefully. Because today, okay. I'm going to be tackling one simple, teeny tiny detail. The thing is, this is talking is about really the future rather than the present. Help so, one two was full yeah, of collectibles. Nobody knows, Most really. Which you get from a prize machine after you beat a minigame. Some are set prizes that relate to the level you just completed, like yeah. a sun figure for beating the first daycare mission, or a meat pretzel for beating the Fazbear Theatre. However, after you beat the game, there are some extra prizes to collect that are given to you at random when you replay a stage. Usually, this is just extra plushies, models, or food. Sure. But sometimes, you get posters, and one of these posters stood out above all Full the rest. Best. It ends up on the back wall right next there to the Fazbear Wrench entrance for the Princess Quest minigame. It's a poster promoting Full It's the Fest stylization for me which does it now, as well. Now, to the FNAF community, Full Fest is nothing new. We first saw this name pop up almost five years Curse ago in the Dread Curse of Dreadbear DLC yeah. for the original Help Wanted. A Halloween inspired event full of attractions, rides, and of course, spooky versions of all our favorite characters to fit in with the Halloween theme. But there is one crucial difference between this full fest and the one we see on the and from and 70. Two, the date. The banners yeah. around the Curse of Dreadbear hub world it's show strange. this it's event strange. was taking place in 1983. But this new poster is from over a decade before. This whole full fest thing has clearly been running for a very long time. Yeah. In fact, it's okay, been running yeah. since before the earliest confirmed parts of the FNAF timeline. In the Silver Eyes, when Charlie is looking for news articles on Fredbear's family diner, she starts the search at 1979, oh. seeming to imply that this was when the diner was founded. But that is nine whole years after this poster was published. And that's not all. Look at the design of this poster. While it's advertising yeah, exactly. Full Fest, it's not inherently spooky like the event we see for the Curse of Dreadbear. Instead, it has autumnal elements, but it's mostly designed to look like an old two-toned circus poster, complete with yeah. a giant circus tent right in the middle. Exactly. It's very very circus themed that that is the thing it's very circus or 
oriented, even though it's like a Halloween sort of vibe. Um, I guess like clowns and stuff. That that also fits in with a lot of the themes around Pizzeria Simulator. Like that that I feel like that was the first game where we properly saw that sort of imagery. You know, we have like the clown drawings on the walls and stuff. Uh, even like the first teaser that we got for Scrap Baby, I, I felt like it was sort of leaning into the circus direction. Um, and of course we have uh, Circus Baby's Pizza World, let's not forget it is Circus Baby, not just Baby. Um, but also, I, I feel like with the stylization of the poster, like we also have the Fred Bear's Family Diner poster that was done in the sort of 1930s style, as um, the game theorists pointed out in their big timeline. I. I think at that point, it's it's difficult because you need to you need to. It it's hard to separate like whether it's just a stylization of a decade or if it actually reflects like like if it's actually from that decade. It's hard to tell. Obviously, with the with the Fred Bear's Family Diner poster, we have the Fifty Cents for Entry, which kind of implies that it might have been quite a while ago. There's a dancing bear, you know, that happened in the 1930s, but like it, it depends. It, it, does this actually mean 1970? I'd say so because it says the date 1970 and it's stylized in that sort of circus 1970s theme, but um, it's, it's always hard to tell. And this isn't the first time Steel Wool has offered us hints that circuses might be important to this franchise. There's They've the mini games in everywhere. Help 2, like the Carousel and Bazaar Blast. Exactly. There's the circus costumes that are down in the basement of Ruin. Yeah. There's even circus themed Funko merch. Clearly, Steel what Wool happened is with beating those? us over the head with this circus thing for a reason. But why? Well, back in 2022, in the build up to Security Breach's Xbox port, Steel Wool did an interview with Game Jolt to talk ah, about here we go, how yeah. they made Security Breach, yeah. give some updates on Ruin's development, and drop some. They little want to hints make an origin what might game. Be coming down the pipeline for them and the FNAF franchise. And when asked what kind of game they'd like to make in the future, they said this. One thing that I've, I've always would love to do is get back to kind of like the origin of like Fazbear Entertainment, kind of yeah. see how things It'd be do. really Same interesting. Here. I'd like to head further back into the 70s. They want to create a game Ooh. about the origins of Freddy's set in the 70s. Most of us at the time assumed this would just be Fred Bear's Family Diner, but with all this circus imagery popping up, I didn't the know they said 70s. What if Fred Bear's Family Diner wasn't the origin of Freddy's? What if instead it was this circus, Fall Fest 1970? And once I realized that, things started to fall into place. This poster is the key to clarifying some massive holes in the FNAF timeline. It confirms a number of things we've been predicting for a while, and it shines a little more light on the franchise's latest villain. Okay. Now to think of it, maybe this isn't such a small theory after all. Whoops. <laughs> so you better grab your popcorn theorist because the show is about right. to begin, and I'm going to reveal to you the true origins of Freddy's. But just before we get into that, I need to talk to you about something else that's really important. It's something you may have seen if you watch our own sister location, Style Theory. But we have an exciting oh, theorist show. event coming up. We are putting on a fashion show. Yeah, it's this called is exciting. Creators in Fashion, this is and cool. it is the first of its kind. Not just because a fashion show has never been done on YouTube before, although that is pretty cool, but because we're getting weird with it. How weird? Well, the first runway of the night is going to be FNAF themed. You heard that right. We've had FNAF games, a FNAF no movie, way. a FNAF cookbook, and now... Now FNAF is completing the theorist no gauntlet shot. and getting a FNAF runway. Although, if you've ever bought That's our so high quality cool. FNAF merch, FNAF being high fashion may not be that surprising. But what might be surprising is what creators we have planned for the event. It's called Creators in Fashion after all, so we wanted to make sure we were spotlighting creators from all corners of the internet and make this okay. one of a kind event even more special. Okay. We've got the likes of ZHC, Seek Discomfort, Cassie Ho, and Critical Role all okay. getting glammed up to strut their stuff. We've got Simply <laughs> Nailogical providing nails for the event, and the whole thing is going to uh, commentated by Rosanna Pansino and Trisha Hirsch. No way! Talk about star power. Uh, of course, we couldn't do a fashion great. show by theorist without some weird little theorist antics going on. Besides the FNAF runway, we've also got dogs walking the runway. And no, I'm not just talking about Santi. I mean literal dogs <laughs> strutting up and down. And I'm not lying to you when I say they look both adorable and fierce. Speaking of fierce, we've also got our amazingly talented host of style theory, Amy, taking center stage to co-host this event alongside the man that I know you've all been missing. That's right, Matt. Matthew Pat is Patrick. coming back to host this very, very special event. And to celebrate, we're going to be drenching the man live on stage. Maybe it's water, maybe it's Nickelodeon slime. Who knows? You'll have to watch the stream to find out. So mark your calendars <laughs> okay. for April 25th at 2.30 p.m. PST. We're going to be going live right here on Game Theory. So if you aren't already, make sure you're subscribed because believe me, you do not want to uh, miss this. If there is a second flash fashion show, uh, <laughs> I would love to dress up in FNAF. 
<laughs> I would love to just come as Freddy Fazbear or the Mimic or in a spring spring trap costume or something. I I will happily walk down a catwalk in in a style theory uh, show in a in a yeah yeah. <laughs> This is this is madness. It it just sounds crazy, but uh, I I will be there. I will be watching. That that sounds amazing. Let's go. Amy has a lot more surprises for you guys up those. Lacy Talk to sleeves. me about so the origins of FNAF. April 25th, 2:30 p.m. PST, right here on Game Theory. I'll see you there. But for now, let's get off the runway and head back to the circus. Now, I understand there may be some hesitancy in me changing up the entire beginning of the timeline. I get it. It's a pretty big Not claim. really. And while there have been I a don't number think so. of events towards circuses throughout the games and books, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where this whole thing started. So, let's take a look at one of the more recent examples of the circus being hinted at, so I can show you where I'm coming from. In the basement of the ruined DLC where you find the mimic, there are two costumes hanging up. An old yes. lady blackbird and an elephant dressed as a clown. In the game files, there's also But also in the books, there's also a lot of circus Three costumes. Animals all associated like a jester. with the circus. Elephants often perform tricks. Lions were regularly tamed by lion tamers. And while crows or blackbirds aren't traditionally circus animals, they do often appear in circus-focused media like Disney's Dumbo. That's true. Plus, That's the true. elephant is literally dressed as a clown. It doesn't get more circusy than that. But the most important part isn't actually their circus theming. It's the fact they aren't animatronic suits. In our initial theory on Ruin, we talked about how these costumes seem to be related to circus babies because you know circus. However, when circus babies entertainment rentals or even circus baby's pizza world was due to launch they were all animatronics and complex ones at that why then would they have physical costumes they wouldn't unless these costumes actually came from something circus themed that was before animatronics were part of this franchise in the mimic not the robot the tales from the pizza yeah. story named after him we learn of a character named edwin who edwin, owns a robotics yeah. company getting and he builds the suits. robot vacuum cleaner however with the birth of his son the death of his wife and then the crippling pressure of running his own business, he decides to sell the company to none yes. other than Fazbear Entertainment. Exactly. Why does Fazbear agree to purchase? Because they want Edwin for his robotics knowledge. Specifically, they want him to turn their character costumes into full-blown animatronics. We've seen him do exactly this with Chica in the first few pages of the story. Later on, he goes on to explain that this is the 18th character he'd been asked to create, describing the collection as, quote, a circus-like array of animal and other character costumes. Yes. Circus-like, you say. We believe for a long time that Edwin is the book's parallel for Henry, the animatronic genius that helped Afton to grow Fazbear into the animatronic empire we know today. Okay. So the circus themed costume- Let me just stop right there. So, I get where you're coming from. Parallel to Henry. Absolutely. There are definitely parallels between the two characters, um, and I, I, I would say that for sure. Like, if, even later on in the story The Storyteller, you have Mr. Burroughs and you have Edwin Murray. They are very clearly, like, pretty much identical parallels to William and Henry. Sure. Absolutely. Even Mr. Burroughs, like, he, he wears purple. Uh, like, like, he is associated with purple. He is evil. He is very clearly parallel to William. And Edwin is parallel to Henry. For sure. That, it, uh, the thing is, it doesn't stop there. I, I, you can have parallels and they can still be in the same universe. So for me at least, what I'm saying is that Edwin and Henry coexist. They can still be parallels, they can still be parallels within the same universe, but they they coexist. They exist in the same universe. Um, Edwin probably supplied the suits to Henry and William and etc. Like, like, I feel like they they aren't the same character. They are very clearly different characters, even if they share some traits and stuff. Do you understand what I mean by that? Um, I hope I haven't caused uh, a controversy uh, in the comments, but um, that's that's what I believe, at least. Um, I think that Edwin does exist in the main game timeline, but there you go. We see in the basement of Ruin likely came from that same time period, a period where Henry was transforming costumes into animatronics. And these costumes aren't okay. Henry's only connection to the circus either. When Charlie goes back to her childhood home in the Silver Eyes, she looks through Henry's Here office and finds an assortment of books <laughs> that, quote, would have seemed eclectic to anyone who didn't know the man. There were books on biology and anatomy, some on human beings, others on animals. There were books about the history of the traveling carnival and of the circus. There were books about child development, about myths and legends, and about sewing patterns 
patterns and techniques. There were volumes Sewing of patterns. about trickster gods, there about you go. hunting bees, and Even about glitch trap is tied in there. and their mascots. Most of these make a lot of sense. Things like anatomy, mascots, sewing patterns, it all ties into the idea that he was creating characters and turning costumes into animatronics. Yeah. The books about child development either tie into the fact that he was catering to kids and so was trying to figure out how he could best serve his customers, or it's linked to the human anatomy books and ties into Henry creating robot versions of his daughter Charlie. Mm -hmm. But there's one selection that has always stood out as odd, one that I've never had an explanation for, and that is the history of the traveling carnival and of the circus. Why would Henry need books weird. on that topic yeah. if all the work he's ever done is on animatronics and diners? He needs it because the origins of Fazbear are rooted in traveling circuses and carnivals. It was a hint as to the first years of this business. So, this circus, Full Fest, seems to be where Fazbear Entertainment all began. But now the question is, who else was there? And I don't mean human characters, let's be honest, we don't have many of them that are actually important, especially okay. not back in 1970. I mean, which of the Fazbear characters yes. were part of the original roster? That is a As good question. During Help Wanted 2, we get a number of minigames that take place in carnival-like settings, namely Fazza Blast and the Carousel. And it's yeah. the carousel that I want us to take a look at first. The game itself is pretty oh, straightforward, okay. you know, when you yeah. don't have an ash trying to desperately keep your microphone attached. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! But despite this, Matt did manage to notice a very interesting detail in the level's design. A random pumpkin. Just sitting there, waiting to be thrown. I think we can oh. all agree that pumpkins are something we specifically associate with Halloween. And the only event we know to take place at Halloween in this franchise is, you guessed it, Full Fest. That's even a get good a Halloween-themed version of Moon appear during the nightmare level of the right, carousel ride. Right. The carousel is from Full Fest, which means it's from the early part of the franchise. But then, take a look ah. at the characters that are used on the carousel. Carousel. Yeah. Freddy, Bonnie, Jimmy, Foxy, which, you know, is what you'd expect. Except it's not just the original versions from FNAF 1. The one that immediately stands out to me is this white and pink version of Foxy. Funtime Foxy? Well, kinda. Because you might also notice it has a hooked hand. Something that Funtime Foxy is clearly lacking in sister location. However, there is a version of Funtime Foxy with a hook hand. And that's in FNAF World, a game that came out before uh... sister location <laughs> and doesn't have any other what? Funtime animatronics present. Implying that Funtime Foxy didn't originally belong with that group of animatronics. Instead, yeah. belonging to an earlier set. And this carousel tells us exactly which group that is. The other characters on this ride, besides Funtime Foxy and the original four, all have rosy red cheeks, which align oh. with the toy animatronics. I, okay, too. I fully believe this. This is a very good theory so far. This, this is actually really good. I believe this. I fully believe this because... Ma like I, I've, I've made theories on like the mangle in the past, and I've said, oh, the mangle connected to Funtime Foxy. There's no way. There is absolutely no way. I would say, well, first of all, FNAF 2 comes way before Sister Location in the timeline. How in the how <laughs> how does it work, right? How does mangle become Funtime Foxy? Surely it should be the other way around. And so I don't think they're the same. I think maybe Funtime Foxy was was built uh, like based around Toy Foxy in this instance, but the mangle has to be separate to Funtime Foxy. And I think this is a really good point pointing out that there was a white fox um, beforehand. So these are the toy animatronics. Yeah, for sure. Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, and Funtime Foxy. The toy version. Let's call him Foxy. Toy Foxy. The toy animatronics being here feels wrong doesn't it? The toys don't become a thing until 1987 with their special recognition software and new, more complex endoskeletons. They replaced the old withered versions of the original Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, that and is interesting. the original Isn't Freddy's. It? How then are they on a ride from 1970? Well, this is because I don't think the toy animatronics are meant to call back to the 1983 Freddy's animatronics. They're supposed to be referencing the original hmm. circus costumes. Going back to the Mimic story, once Edwin abandons the warehouse, Fazbear employees are sent in to collect any Fazbear property. <laughs> things like their costumes. One character mentions a few of them. A brown Freddy Fazbear costume, a yellow Chica costume, a Foxy costume, a Bonnie costume. The original four were all in existence as costumes yes. before their introduction as animatronics at Freddy yeah. Fazbear's Pizza. And what's even crazier is the designs of those costumes actually exist. A few years ago, there was a, let's just say controversial, but at the time, official FNAF artist that dropped an image oh. onto the FNAF subreddit with zero context or explanation. The only thing we knew is that these 
images contain You're right. copyright. These images were and they are by toy designs, which makes them as good a piece of evidence as any. And what are these images of? Versions of Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica in a similar style to the mascot costumes you'd find at a theme park like Disneyland. But not only that, they are they are the toy and animatronics. round heads in order to have a human fit inside them. These appear to be the original costumes for the characters. And where were these costumes used? I suspect they were worn at the circus. Why? Well, notice the <laughs> cheeks. Exaggerated features like big oh, red noses this is really or good. cheeks have been used by clowns and circus performers for yeah. centuries. Joseph Grimaldi is recognized as being the ancestor for modern clowns. And in 1802, he created the design for his most iconic character, Joey the Clown. And one of this character's iconic features was painted red cheeks. Similarly, Albert Fratellini is known to have helped redefine a type of clown in the mid 1900s known okay. as the August Clown, complete with the bright red yes. nose we know today. Why did both these performers feel it necessary to have bright red features for the evolution of the clown? Because when the word clown was first recorded in 1560, it meant rustic, boar, or peasant. This often boiled down to one simple stereotype, the town drunk, who you would often see after you'd had a yeah. bit too much to drink. Bright red nose, bright red, red, red cheeks, and yeah. Red cheeks. This happens when your body isn't able to digest alcohol properly, causing a release of histamines that essentially cause your face to yeah. have an allergic reaction, namely red cheeks and nose. The idea of referencing this was to make clowns or characters immediately look foolish, silly or disarming, so people would be quicker to laugh at them rather than be scared of them. Which is pretty ironic when you think about it. That is why I believe these costumes are circus costumes. Not because they're, they're trying to make characters <laughs> look like drunks, yeah. that wouldn't be very child friendly. It was to invoke those same reactions of Silly, goofy, fun. And the kicker is you can see this trait carried over into the most definitively circus costume we've got available. Yeah. And also, if you look at those mascot costumes that the Mimic has down underneath the pizza plex, they are very similar to those designs that I think it was Lady Fidzy made, right? They, they have like, if you look at the structure of the bodies, they're like very curved, like not an hourglass shape, but... Um, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it, but like very curved, big bellies, like very, very obviously a human could fit in it. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, very clearly like big suits, not something that you would put a robot in, I would say, although the mimic exists, so you can put a robot in it if you would like, but um, that, that is a very good point, I think, um, to bring up those that that art, and I think the the fact that it it does display the toy animatronics and the big red rosy cheeks and stuff, it it is all connected. It it is really strange how much circus content we've had over the past like ten years of, of FNAF. Like it's crazy that it's kind of been in the background this entire time, but it is a theme that exists and is one that is going to come into fruition more uh, in the future of the series. I would say. Usually you don't get a chance to see them up close, but freeze the frame just right or, you know, search the game files and you'll find that although a little faded, it too has rosy red cheeks. So red cheek characters like the ones we see in these designs would have been right at home at a circus, which also opens up the door to other red cheek characters from this franchise to potentially be part of the original roster. Maybe characters that weren't originally animal costumes, but more likely humans wearing the same kind of face paint. Case in point, Balloon Boy. Hello. Balloon Boy has never really fit in anywhere. We turned on FNAF 2 and he was just there. Yeah, and we that's hated true. him ever but since. But even just like the fact that he's a balloon boy. Just the fact that he's a balloon boy. He got his oh, own arcade yes. cabinet, Balloon World. And if you played that game, you'd see a circus tent in the yeah. background. Balloon Boy. That's where the balloon circus stuff came from as well. Places him at the circus. But while he never fit in with FNAF 2's characters, he did have a striking resemblance to a handful of characters in Sister Location and Circus yeah. Babies. Other wooden puppets like the Magician and Fortune Teller, all jobs that would be found at a yeah. circus. Selling balloons was an important part of any circus, so Balloon Boy with his little sign offering them to children would be right at home with the That's rest what of I mean. them. And to yeah. top it all off, when Funko decided to release their new circus line of FNAF products, it contained not just clown versions of all the characters, but versions balloons. of all of them wearing balloon that, orders. That's exactly do I mean outfit. we were being shown that balloon characters and specifically that outfit are inherently well, balloon boy was like the first circus, circus thing boy in FNAF, has I would say. to be a part of this full fest is where he finally makes sense another example would be circus baby she's been showing up a lot in recent games just like the circus imagery so it feels like steel wool are purposely trying to connect the two she's also got the red cheeks we've talked about as well as that white face paint she is called circus baby clowns. she'd fit right she's literally a, a clown plus you know she's literally got circus there you go. in her name maybe <laughs> 
this character, who's placed British the boys on the same wavelength, perplexed us for so long, belongs way earlier in the franchise's history than any of us expected. But above those two, in the books, there is one other costume that gets called out. The core four, jester. but always one more, a jester costume. Now, I'm sure Mad is once again freaking out because jesters aren't clowns and they aren't part of a circus. And dude, I get it, but just trust me on this. In that quote from the Mimic story about the rack of costumes, after listing off the main four characters we know and love, they finish off by adding and bright pink, yellow, green court jester costumes, similar to the colors we see Sun wearing in Security Breach. Yeah, I know they're a little off, but they're, they're pretty close. And just look at the rest of his costume. Curly pointed toes with bells, puffy trousers or pants, I suppose. He is the, the closest tutu, thing like, to a jester in the series. Ankles. He is 100% meant to be a court jester. He even jumps out of a freaking castle when we first meet yeah. him in Security Breach. And as Matt was very keen to point out, jesters originated as performers for royalty in their castles during the Middle Ages. Finally, there's the epilogues, where the jester character once again returns. But this time, we get a description of its mask. Quote, Lucia stepped up to the costume, suppressing a shiver at the jester's leering, toothy grin and its wide eyes. One of okay. Sun's most distinct features is his obnoxious I can see it. grin. It's so iconic that he had to have teeth underneath his teeth just in case. And those large vacant eyes definitely give off that leering vibe that Lucia was mm. describing. So even though Sun doesn't have the red cheeks like we talked about, he still appears to be very obviously connected to the original crew, Freddy, Chica, so strange. Bobby, and Bonnie, as well as the circus. He is the last one mentioned when they're all being listed off, as if the costumes were grouped together, like they came from the same collection of characters, solar system. <laughs> characters that came from Fazbear's circus days. Sun and Moon actually make a lot of sense as characters in a traveling circus. In the Tales story Bobby Dots, we get a bit of much needed backstory on this character who just showed yeah, up in security. They were originally not in, the, in any the of the 80s tastic designs of Peterplex. It turns out they weren't always a daycare attendant, but instead a performer. They put on shows where Sun would be the hero and when the lights went out, Moon would appear as the story's yeah. villain. That ties into the comedy and tragedy masks yeah, that we exactly. found in Ruin. Masks that display Sun and Moon. And we know face. there's still a theater so, in the daycare. Been an ideal performance well. to keep kids entertained at a circus venue. And later on when the daycare was introduced, that same Bobby Dot story describes the daycare's design as a carnival-like hmm. space, hammering home the connection to the character's origins. And then the icing on the cake, during Help Wanted 2, he is the one we face when we're trying to fix the carousel from those oh. awful fest days. He's been there That's since true. the That's start. True. And when you think about it, in the early days of the franchise when you're trying to keep costs down, buying a full mascot costume or fursuit from a trusted provider can cost upwards of $5,000, while costumes for professional jesters and clowns are typically just a few hundred bucks. Yeah, you're saving money nice yeah. and low when you're first starting good point out. it really feels like the circus origin is helping characters that are out of place have a place to finally belong hmm. sun and moon baby balloon boy all of them will be right at home here at the circus however full fest isn't just the origins of the fazbear franchise it's also the origins of william afton's first major here we go Faz a blast in help wanted 2 is a shooting okay. gallery that matches the design of the hub world during the curse of dreadbear yes. dlc dreadbear even makes an appearance at the attraction so this attraction clearly takes place it connects the full best, yeah. Three. However, the penultimate Phaser Blast level ends with you shooting a number of rockets and popping all the balloon versions of the animatronics that appear. Doing so seems to cause a chain reaction that leads this to the whole thing so ending cool, up man. in flames. And when you go back for the final level, the place is burnt to the ground. We see the same thing happen during the carousel ride. As you try to fix it, sparks fly and the thing lights up, leading to the nightmare version of the level where the whole place is already ablaze. And if you go out of bounds during that carousel level, you can see the red sky, burnt trees, water water tower and windmill that are all present during that final phaser blast level oh. in the distance. Steel Wool is clearly showing us that much that like every connected. other establishment in this franchise, this event, so, Fest 1983, ended in fire. So technically, okay, right, right. You are you are onto something here. So technically we're saying we've actually already been to to this full fest in the 1970s or or we, we, we've been to kind of like an AR version or VR version in the in the sense that um, in Help Wanted 2, we are... It, it's hard to explain. We're, we're not actually there. We're playing VR. I don't know how to explain it. I can't explain it. We're, we, we've got the mask on, etc. Um, so it's not the actual reality of it. But we are seeing into the past in the sense that... Um, we are seeing Full Fest 1970. We are seeing the Jester costume. We are seeing this carousel. We are seeing Fazer Blast, which probably would have been an attraction as well, actually, at the Travelling Circus. So I think we, we do keep seeing this. And I think you are incredibly right. Uh, Full Fest is something that is held every fall. Uh, 
and it's it's a traveling circus i i think that that is true and i do think it does end in flames was there another incident there though i i feel like there could have been i feel like maybe william's first murder could be there maybe it was too early though i mean or maybe charlotte could have been killed in 1983 like at full fest well not at full fest it's it's hard it, it's hard to kind of to know when we don't have the information for it you know 1983 sucked for this franchise, but especially for Afton. He loses his kid to a malfunctioning springlock suit and his other son's negligence. Yeah. Fredbear's family diner gets shut down, and to top it all off, he full loses fest. the thing that started this okay. whole business. Okay, so we're saying full fest. Steel Wool is 83 all about was a the last one. villain backstory. Try not to set out to make a cool looking villain. Go make a monster, they have a reason for it. These aren't just like these supernatural forces that came out of nowhere to just hurt people and punish people, right? Like there were results of other wrongdoing. Oh, Adding a yeah. fire to an already pretty awful list of tragedy and loss, it would make it a little less surprising that Afton could suddenly snap and go on a murder spree. Mm -hmm. But this fire tells us more than just how this first chapter in FNAF history ended. It also tells us that there was one other character here, someone else present from the beginning that you wouldn't suspect. The Mimic! Yeah, I know, I was surprised too, but everything seems to be pointing to this guy being here since the earliest days of the franchise. I mean, the story the Mimic happens in the 70s. The mimic during the epilogue I will, I will say that. Pizzaplex. Sometimes it's a traditional endoskeleton, other times it's a spider-like mess of slimy black wires. But when we are first introduced to it, we're given one extra detail. A detail that I never fully understood. Quote, it wasn't just a basic metal structure. Its steel frame was contained within a building collection of metal rods and curved plates and an impressive system of ball joints and pistons. All of it was topped with a long, vaguely rectangular shaped shiny steel skull. The skull was the only part that was shiny. The rest was dark and discolored as if it had survived some kind of fire. That's a pretty oh. specific way of phrasing it, especially when it points out that the head isn't blackened by the same issue. Oh. We're being given a clue as to where this mimic came You're from. Right. Because the other detail that's important to bear in mind is that quote comes from the very start very of the first story epilogue. when the endoskeleton first arrives at the pizza place. Yeah. It was delivered to this location already. And you're burnt, right, that, which that tells line us never that made had sense to me. in a previous Fazbear fire. And I believe that fire was the fire of Full Fest. Okay. But what makes me so sure that the mimic got all burned during that fire specifically? Here's the thing. I know we always joke that everything in this franchise ends in fire, but we can actually count the number of fires on one hand uh apologies i have had to change rooms <laughs> midway through the video so i i'm very sorry to just kind of interrupt but um i'm gonna go back like 20 seconds and just uh continue sorry for the weird cut it had to be in a previous fazbear fire and i believe that fire kind of has the to be the fire of full fest, fest right but what makes me so sure that the mimic got all burned during that fire specifically here's the thing i know we always joke that everything in this franchise ends in fire but we can actually count the number of fires on one hand even if you're an animatronic with only four fingers which means it shouldn't be too difficult to go through each one and determine which one the mimic came from working backwards there's a fire at the end of security breach if you yes. have burn trap ending afton is defeated the blob steals him away and the entire pizza plex okay. catches fire yeah collapses. so there's four but fires but as we've talked about before it doesn't seem like this is the canon ending for security breach we find gregory's drawings for the non-canon endings during ruin and yeah last it does seem made up is his drawing of the burn trap i do think burn trap still fire existed though. wasn't a real fire and even if it was this ending takes place at the pizza plex so the mimic couldn't have been delivered to the pizza plex burnt from a fire as the burn trap ending comes later yeah. in the timeline Good second point. option is the fnaf 6 fire but once again Again, we face issues with timeline. The Pizzaplex is being built on top of the FNAF 6 location, which means the Mimic wouldn't be able to be delivered exactly. to the location when the exactly. Pizzaplex is being constructed, like we see. And in that the was the whole problem that I had with this fire, right? The only other fire left other than Full Fest is the FNAF 3 fire, but the owners of Fazbear Fright seemed pretty stoked when they found their first working animatronic, Springtrap. Up until this point, they'd only had bits and pieces like a foxy head. So it feels like they'd have also made a pretty big deal of finding a Mimic, bringing it back to the location, even if they thought it was just an end. So it doesn't feel like it can be that one either, which leaves only one fire for the Mimic to have been burnt in. The fire of Full Fest 1983, meaning the Mimic has been around for a long time. 
We actually theorized this back when we covered Sun and Moon after the events of Ruin. We connected the mimics thrown together, thin, simple animatronic mm -hmm. design to that of Sun and Moon. Namely, a very weird but distinct feature yeah. in independently moving teeth. Yeah. It's a strange design detail that we've never seen before. So for both characters to have the same That's true. in they the are same connected. game makes it seem yeah. like they have to be connected in some way. And if Sun and Moon come from the early Full Fest origins of the franchise, then the mimic being around at the same time would explain that connection. But there's one more detail that tells me that the mimic has to have been around during the Full Fest era of FNAF. Something that's been right under our noses for years. For a while now, we've believed that the glitch trap oh, virus in Help Stitches. 51, the virus yeah. that takes the shape of a yellow bunny rabbit and takes over Vanessa's mind, isn't actually William Afton himself, but instead a version of the mimic program that is mimicking He must have behavior. seen the Stitches In the game, before. we heard about Fazbear trying to keep costs or, down for this hmm. new game they're developing. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, Said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding or That's so stupid. <laughs> it was a budget thing, I guess. It was just junk. Yeah. Circuit boards and things. Mimic like one that. program. Look pretty old. That game was Help Wanted. It's an in-universe game that takes the original FNAF games and turns them into new VR experiences, which is exactly what we learn happened to the Mimic program in the Storyteller. Quote: It's a simple template-style software that takes previously created stories and rearranges them yeah. into new scenarios for VR, AR, and arcade games. That is what Glitchtrap is. The Mimic program, having been scanned into the system, gets a crash course in mm -hmm. Athens murder tendencies and is now mimicking it. Hence, he appears as Afton's iconic yellow rabbit. Except there's one part of this explanation that never sat right with me. If the Glitchtrap mimic was learning about Afton from the in-universe games of FNAF 1 to 6, then why does he take this form? Afton in all of those games, even in the 8-bit minigames, is always wearing his Springlock suit because that was the costume yeah. he wore at Fredbear's Family Diner. But the version of the suit the mimic shows us as Glitchtrap is a completely different design. And at the time, we'd never, we'd never seen, seen a design before. like this, this before. Isn't his springlock suit. It's a hand sewn yeah. suit with plastic looking facial features similar to the ones we saw on that concept art. Those suits came from Full Fest, and so it would make you sense even for these like hand sewn golden on the suit to have also of the come suit. from the it's, same time period. Crazy. But for the mimic to have been able to copy this design, it would have to have some memory of this version of Afton in its memory banks prior yeah, to being he's, uploaded he's right, he's into right. the wanted game system. It would there have must to have, have been a spring Afton suit. perform in this iconic golden rabbit costume alongside yeah. a golden singing bear at Full Fest. The Mimic would have to be around during the early costume days of the franchise. Tape Girl did say the circuit boards looked pretty old after all. It was just junk. Circuit boards and things like that look pretty old. Maybe the Mimic was originally meant to mimic Afton specifically. I'm not entirely sure of this to be honest, but it does yeah. feel like this is where the It's hard to tell headed. why Both the Mimic Fest is mimicking Afton specifically. And the Afton Diner were open until 1983 after all. So they coexisted for at least four years with the Diner opening in 1979. And we know that Afton was performing as Spring Bonnie at the Diner. So it's possible that the Mimic was part of Afton's plan to expand the business. He could literally be in two places at once. Eventually, the Mimic would be locked underground with some circuit boards containing its programming set aside just in case. And when the Mimic software was finally used again to help speed up the process of a new VR game, it was shown all of those old FNAF games. And while it watched and learned, it recognized someone, William Afton, the golden rabbit from the circus, and so decided to take on the form it remembered from all those years ago, creating the monster we have spent the last three games and two DLCs trying and to like stop. And like 15 but books. Hey, that's just a theory. A game theory! Okay, okay. You actually cooked with this one Tom I'm not gonna lie that was really good the only stickle point I would say is um the whole use of books again but that's always gonna be something that I think a lot of fans are gonna disagree with either way so um or like on either side right if, if you say that the books are completely canon to the game's timeline people are gonna disagree if you say they aren't people are still gonna disagree so you can't please everyone but um Really, really like this theory. I think this is a really, really strong video, actually. Um, one of their strongest in the previous year, I would say. Uh, I don't want I don't want that to be to sound mean, but um, it, this really is really good work. Uh, like this is forward thinking. This is really connecting the dots and making sure that those connections uh, have other pieces of evidence to 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 hold on to it. I really think that there is this whole circus theme going on and I do think you are right in saying that the Mimic was very, very early in the timeline. One of the earliest things in the timeline along with Sun and Moon and Balloon Boy and Circus Baby and all of that. 
I think that you are right. And I, I really hope that we do get a game in the near future uh, relating to Full Fest or a traveling circus or something like that. I think that'll be really cool. But uh, it seems like we're getting a lot of those themes anyway in these games at the moment. But uh, yeah, that was a very good watch. Thank you so much to the Game Theorists for continuing with their FNAF content as always. It's really enjoyable to watch all the time. I really love the edits um, and I just enjoy, I, I just enjoy being a part of it. I enjoy watching. So thank you guys so much for watching this reaction. If you enjoyed, make sure you like and subscribe and I will see you in another one. Goodbye.